Hello, my name is Jim Deutsch, and I'm a curator with the Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC, in the United States. And my lecture is part of a series of lectures presented by curators like myself at the Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage as we discuss the cultural heritage of diverse communities. And my topic for today is cultural conversations at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival and beyond. First, I'd like to give you some background about the Smithsonian Institution, which is the National Museum of the United States. The Smithsonian Institution was established by an act of Congress in the year 1846. And the mission for this new institution was that it should promote the increase and in diffusion of knowledge. I like those words a lot. We at the Smithsonian, we strive to educate people around the world by promoting the increase and in diffusion of knowledge. And I should say that the Smithsonian Institution, we like to call ourselves the world's largest museum and research complex with 19 major museums, a national zoo, and many research centers, such as the Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage or CFCH as we call it. The mission statement for CFCH is that through the power of culture, we build understanding, strengthen communities and reinforce our shared humanity. And like the idea of promoting the increase in diffusion of knowledge, I like those words a lot. And we at CFCH, we take those words and our mission very seriously. So through all of our efforts, we, we try to build understanding, meaning that we help people understand the world around them. Second, we strengthen communities, the communities that we serve, uh, the public and the communities that we document, that we research and that we support in terms of their cultural heritage. And finally, we reinforce the shared humanity of all of us. So what I'll be talking about today is the way in which we do all these three things, build understanding, strengthen communities and reinforce our shared humanity through our Smithsonian Folklife Festival. Now the festival began in 1967 and it began according to our own kind of festival folklore with words that were said by S. Dylan Ripley, who's the man you see on the left in this photograph. Ripley was secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, meaning that he was the head of the Smithsonian Institution. And what he told to Ralph Rimsler, the founding director of the Smithsonian Folklife Festival, is that I want you to take the instruments out of their cases and make them sing. Meaning that the Smithsonian Institution had all these instruments inside glass cases that you couldn't touch. You could see only behind the glass. And what Ripley is supposed to have told Rimsler is, take the instruments out of their cases and show that they are used by living people around the United States and around the world today. Now, Ripley did not mean that literally. He didn't want Rinsler to go into the museums and you know, take the instruments out of their cases, but metaphorically, that's what he meant. To show that these instruments are being used, that they are part of traditional culture. They're not just museum artifacts or unused objects, but they're living instruments or used by living people. And so the festival began with this statement of Ripley to Rinsler in 1967. Now the 1960s, I think were a very influential time and it's no accident that the festival begins in the 1960s. The 1960s, and I should say I was there, <laughs> Uh, the 1960s, it was a time of questioning, a time of challenging, a time of asking questions about how can we make things better? 
And the Smithsonian Folklife Festival is one of these ideas which comes out of this cultural ferment. Another part of the 1960s was relevance, the idea of making things relevant for the times. And what Ripley and Rinsler felt was that the Smithsonian Institution needed to become more relevant at this time. It was also a time of greater diversity, of telling history and telling the story of the United States in a way that was different from previous methods, which were largely telling the history from the top down. The idea of the Folk Life Festival was to tell it from the perspective of the folk. You know, the presidents of the United States uh, is something that the Smithsonian Institution did a lot of through the gowns of the first ladies or portraits of the president. But the idea of Ripley and Rinsler was to look at the traditions and the customs, the crafts, the music, the dance, the storytelling of the folk. And out of that comes the Smithsonian Folk Life Festival. Now, there are a number of different ways that we at CFCH talk about the festival, but one of them is that to say that it's a museum without walls. It's an outdoor festival. You know, the Smithsonian has all these museums indoors, but the Folk Life Festival was something very different. It was literally a museum without walls, open and free to the public, lasting for 10 days during June and July in Washington, D.C. in the summer. And the fact that it's free and the fact that it that you can get there from many different entry points means that it's very difficult for us to figure out how many visitors we have. We estimate anywhere between half a million and one million visitors during 10 days of the festival. But we're, we're not really sure because we can't count them. You know, in a museum, you can count the visitors coming in or going out. We can't do that at the festival. There's no one gate that people have to walk through. But based on other factors, based on our food sales, based on our marketplace or craft sales, uh, based on congestion, we estimate between half a million and one million visitors at this open air museum. A second characteristic is we like to say that the word festival is a verb, not a noun. You know, a noun would be like the festival, but a verb gives it more action we will festival. Now in English, we don't really use festival as a verb, but this is the metaphoric idea of action and activity and telling the stories of people whose stories were not normally told throughout the Smithsonian Institution. A third element is that the festival is a means of conveying and promoting living cultural heritage. This, you know, this is the heritage of living people. Uh, and again, throughout the Smithsonian Institution at our National Museum of American History or our National Museum of African American History and Culture or our National Museum of Natural History, it's mostly objects in cases. But the Folk Life Festival focuses on the people, not the objects. And it's the people who tell the stories in ways that I think objects are not really able to tell very well. Now, I love museums. I love going to museums and looking at objects, but the Folk Life Festival, this museum without walls, does it in a very different way to promote and to conserve our living cultural heritage. Another way that we describe the festival, we say that the festival is culture of, by, and for the people. And this phrase, culture of, by, and for the people, resonates very deeply in American culture. It actually comes from Abraham Lincoln, our 16th president. In 1863, his famous Gettysburg Address, he said that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. So our Folk Life Festival is culture of the people, by the people, and for the people. And those are very important 
characteristics that we try to maintain and promote when we produce our Folklife Festival every summer. Also, the festival is based on research and collaboration. And that's very important, uh, this idea of collaboration. When we as curators curate a festival program, we are always working in close collaboration with the cultures that we are presenting. So it's not just curators at the Smithsonian Institution imposing our view, but rather curators and art designers and technical experts and administrative staff working in close collaboration with our partners to produce this amazing event as a collaboration. And it's something that we've been doing every summer since 1967, outdoors on the National Mall. Now, as I said, it's a 10 day festival and it usually takes place around the 4th of July, which is our National Independence Day. It's the, the date going back to 1776, 245 years ago, when the United States declared its independence from Great Britain. And it takes place not only, well, it takes place around the 4th of July, our most important civic holiday, and it takes place in our most important civic space, which is the National Mall of the United States in Washington, D.C. If you look at the picture, you see that the National Mall is that green space between the U.S. Capitol, the seat of our government, and the Lincoln Memorial, a memorial to the president I just talked about. Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and in between the Capitol and the Lincoln Memorial, see the Washington Monument, a monument to our first president, George Washington, for whom Washington, D.C. is named. It's the largest freestanding masonry structure in the world, 555 feet, 169 meters tall. Uh, the buildings around the green space are mostly museums of the Smithsonian Institution. So you see that this is, as I said, the most important civic space in our nation's capital, taking place on our most uh, important civic holiday. So all of this reinforces the significance and importance of the Folklife Festival as we seek to promote and conserve cultural heritage around the world. You know, the, the mall, is a very, a very special place. Uh, normally, every weekend, there is some type of activity, demonstration, rally, festival taking place on the National Mall. For example, uh, in August 1963 on the National Mall, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King gave perhaps his most famous speech, the speech that we call, I Have a Dream. He was standing right in front of the Lincoln Memorial, looking east toward the Washington Monument and, and towards the museums of the Smithsonian Institution. Now, 1963 was before the Folklife Festival began, but it is part of what I'm calling this cultural ferment, calling for civil rights and equal justice that made such an impression on people like Dylan Ripley and Ralph Rinsler to create the Folklife Festival just four years later. The National Mall is also where presidential inaugurations take place, such as the inauguration of Barack Obama in January 2009, where the mall was just covered with people watching that momentous event. So that's where our Folklife Festival takes place, uh, a very special place at a very special time. In fact, the National Mall is managed by the US National Park Service, which is the same agency that oversees our national parks, you know, like the Grand Canyon or Yellowstone National Park, Yosemite National Park, parks of great natural beauty, but also uh, parks and monuments of historical significance. So the fact that the National Mall is managed and protected by the US National Park Service I think underscores its significance and its value to all of us. So some of the keywords I've mentioned, this idea of building understanding, uh, 
but also the continuity of diverse contemporary grassroots cultural traditions in the United States and around the world. That is our, that is the focus of what we at the Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage do. And again, this idea of working collaboratively with exemplary artists and their cultural communities. So since 1967, since the first festival in 1967, we have featured at least 90 nations, every geographic and cultural region of the United States, scores of different ethnic communities, Native American groups, and occupations. For example, we did a program in 2001 on masters of the building arts. We've done programs on transportation workers, on uh, energy workers. We even did a program on American trial lawyers as an occupational group. Now, I remember this was in 1986. I remember, uh, now I wasn't working at the Smithsonian then, but I've heard people asking, well, what are trial lawyers doing at a folk life festival? Because the idea, really a misunderstanding is that the folk are people who live in remote geographic areas, people without much education. And of course, trial lawyers are highly educated. Um, but this is true for every occupational group has a distinctive occupational culture, which they learn among themselves. So the folk culture of trial lawyers is not what they learn in law school, but rather what they learn by being a member of this occupational group through the process of observation and imitation. They will observe master trial lawyers and they will imitate some of their traditions and customs and activities, much like the way that a master folk singer or a master storyteller or a master craftsperson will learn through the process of observation and imitation. And so that's what we do at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival, which has become now the largest annual cultural event in Washington, DC. One of the pleasures of working at the festival is that every year we're doing something different. So since I've been a curator, which is since the year 2003, I have worked on programs dealing with World War II, with the US Forest Service, with the province of Alberta, Canada, with the Mekong River region, with the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, uh, with the US Peace Corps Agency, with Hungary and China and Circus Arts and Armenia. You know, this for me is the great pleasure of working at CFCH is that every year we are learning new things working on new programs. Now, of course, in the last two years, in 2020 and 2021, because of the coronavirus pandemic, we've had to move to programs we're calling Beyond the Mall that are virtual programs rather than in-person programs. But we're hoping in 2022 to return to live in-person programs on the National Mall. I've mentioned um, one of my favorite programs was what we did in 2007 on the Mekong River featuring five countries, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Vietnam, and um, China's Yunnan province, all of which share cultural traditions by virtue of their being along the Mekong River. And in this photograph from the Mekong River program in 2007, you see the Banar Rangio people who came from the central highlands of Vietnam. We brought them from Vietnam to Washington, DC. In fact, when, when they came to Washington, most of them had never been out of Vietnam. Many of them had never even been to the capital, Hanoi, which they visited for the first time to get their passports and visas so they could come to the United States and participate in the Smithsonian Folklife Festival. And even though they had never been outside their country or never been to Washington DC before, when they came to Washington to the National Mall, they realized how important this space was. They realized the ways in which we were honoring them and their cultural traditions. And I think it gave them a sense of renewed pride in their own culture 
and their own traditions. You know, using the significance of the National Mall and its status to communicate important messages, uh, much like the way that Martin Luther King used the National Mall to communicate his message about, I have a dream. So this is one of the most important functions of the festival to develop this sense of pride in your community, pride in your traditions. That's why we say that we are building understanding and we are strengthening communities. And I think that we certainly strengthen the community of the Banar Rangio people by bringing them to the Mekong River program in 2007 at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival. What we do at the festival is we allow artists, musicians, and culture bearers to perform, to cook, to demonstrate, to narrate, to illustrate, and speak for themselves. That's also a very important element of the Smithsonian Folklife Festival. We do not tell participants what to say. Rather, we allow them to speak for themselves and to present their traditions. And again, this, these traditions coming from the grassroots, not the Smithsonian imposing its view, but rather letting the participants and the community speak for themselves and to have conversations when they speak with our visitors which brings me to the title of my lecture, which is the cultural conversations at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival and beyond. So we as curators are always trying to foster these types of cultural conversations, allowing people to speak with our visitors, but always to speak for themselves, which is another way of talking about culture of the people, by the people, and for the people, not a type of top-down authoritarian dynamic, but the idea of cultural democracy. So we represent the communities and their traditional cultures for our diverse public, the half a million to one million visitors, which is, I think, a very diverse group of people. We know that most of them, meaning about 50 to 60%, come from the Washington DC area. But we also get a lot of people who are visiting from other places within the United States and places around the world who come to the Folklife Festival precisely so they can engage in these cultural conversations that we as curators try to stimulate. So how do we do this? Well, one way at the festival is through what we call our discussion stages. The discussion stages are venues where people can discuss contemporary cultural issues about their cultural heritage and to do so in ways that preserve, promote, and maintain their cultural heritage. So one of my favorite examples of these conversations on our discussion stages comes from the Folklife Festival in 2008 when we had three programs, one NASA, our National Aeronautics and Space Administration, two Bhutan, the tiny kingdom between China and India, and three, the state of Texas in the United States. And in many of our discussions on these discussion stages, we brought participants from all three programs. That is, we had participants from NASA and from Texas and from Bhutan. And one of my favorite conversations was about food in remote places. We had astronauts talking about food from the International Space Station in space. That's a remote place. We had participants from Bhutan talking about food in some of the remote places of Bhutan. And similarly, participants from Texas, from some of the remote areas. So how do you prepare food in these remote places? A second conversation on the discussion stage that brought people together was talking about boots. So we had the astronauts talking about their space boots. We had the Bhutanese talking about Bhutanese boots, which are very elaborately uh, crafted boots. And then we had Texans talking about their Texan boots and, and talking about the way, some of the similarities, uh, the shared humanity of NASA astronauts, uh, Bhutanese and Texans. We also had a conversation with Bhutanese monks 
talking with NASA astronauts about their conceptions of the heavens. The NASA astronauts had been in space, the Bhutanese had not, but they were able to talk about their similar conceptions. And that's what we do at the Folklife Festival is bring people together for these cultural conversations. Another element of the festival is that through uh, crafts and artistry, it illustrates ongoing contemporary creativity that is rooted in tradition. And one of my favorite examples is from the Folklife Festival in 2002, where we featured the Silk Road, roughly 25 countries along the Silk Road from China, Japan, and Korea in the East, all the way to Venice, Italy in the West, through Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, all the stans. And we brought to illustrate this movement along the Silk Road, a beautifully painted truck that came from Karachi, Pakistan. In fact, our researcher, Mark Kanoya from the University of Wisconsin went to Karachi and his mission was to purchase a great example of a painted truck for transportation along the Silk Road. And through tr Mark's tremendous efforts and a wonderful shipping company, we got this truck from Karachi to Washington, DC. And I was one of those who worked on uh, that transporting the truck from Karachi to the United States. And we not only brought the truck, but we brought the painter, Haider Ali, and the metal fabricator, Jamil Udin, the two people who had created this object. And they were there to talk with our visitors, to share their culture and their traditions. We had a translator, translated from Urdu to English, so that our, our visitors could have a cultural conversation with the painter and the fabricator. And, and because you know, this object obviously attracted a lot of attention and people wanted to talk to Haider Ali and Jamil Udin. You could see it for, you know, for meters around. And uh, we not only brought the painted truck, we also brought camels because historically camels were the main means of transportation along the Silk Road. Uh, because of regulations um, concerning health, we could not bring animals from Central Asia, but we found Bactrian camels in the state of Texas with an organization called the Texas Camel Corps. So you'll sometimes see photographs from the festival of camels juxtaposed with our painted truck. Two very different types of transportation, uh, but both traditional means of transportation along the Silk Road, ways in which we were able to connect cultures. Something else about the Silk Road Festival is that it took place in June and July of 2002 which means it was the first Folklife Festival to take place after what happened on September 11th, 2001 with the attack on the Pentagon and the World Trade Center. But the, the idea of this festival was not to show hostility, but to show ways in which people could come together and connect through their traditional cultures, bringing them together to, again, show this idea of reinforcing our shared humanity. And this was probably our most successful Folklife Festival ever with more than 1 million visitors attending. So we bring craft objects like the painted truck, we bring artists like the painter and the metal fabricator to demonstrate and to share their traditions. We also have what we call foodways demonstrations, you know, demonstrating the traditions of food. And in this photograph taken from the China program in 2014, you'll see they're making Miao style poached sour beef. And for our foodways traditions, it's much more than just the food. It's more than just the recipe. It's about the culture and the underlying traditions. And so we bring people to talk about the traditions of the way that you present and prepare and consume 
the food in your home. As a general rule, we do not bring professional chefs, but rather more ordinary people who learn their food waste traditions from their parents or their grandparents or from other members of their communities. People who are able to talk about the significance of food because everybody eats, right? Everybody has some food waste story. And our food waste demonstrations are very popular because it's something that everybody can relate to. Again, this idea of reinforcing our shared humanity. You may not know how to cook meow style poached sour beef, but you understand what it's about. You'll see in this photograph that there's a mirror on top so that you can watch the chef prepare the dish from a distance. See, yeah, the mirror reflects down on what the chef is doing in terms of mixing and frying and stirring a dash of this and a dash of that. Musical performances are also a very important part of our Smithsonian Folklife Festival. And this photograph shows the Dimendong Folk Chorus, which came in 2013 as a preview of the China program that we did in 2014. We have some wonderful recordings of the Demon Dong. Also in that same year in 2013, we featured members of the Celeste Daini community from the Oregon coast, the West coast of the United States. It was part of a program we called One World Many Voices that looked at endangered languages around the world. And the Celeste Daini were one of those communities. It's one of those communities in fact, where at one point, they were down to very few fluent speakers of the language. But thanks to efforts to preserve and promote that language, it's had a bit of a renaissance. So we brought members of that community from the Celeste they need to the Folklife Festival to talk about their successful efforts to promote and preserve their linguistic heritage. Another part of the Folklife Festival is we always have a marketplace where we sell craft items that are produced by the people that we bring to the festival. So this shows a sample of items from our marketplace in 2014 when we featured China and Kenya. You'll notice at the top uh, are kites from China. In fact, that year we had a fourth generation kite maker from Beijing, Mr. Ha Yi Qi, whose family has been making kites in Beijing since the late 19th century. He's someone who inherited this rich tradition of kite making, and we were able to sell his kites in our marketplace. So not just kites, you know, basketry, engraving, etchings, embroidery, the marketplace at the festival is a wonderful opportunity, both for the artists to sell their items, but also for our visitors who want something genuine. And for them, they can not only purchase the item, but they can meet the person who made the object they are acquiring and have one of these cultural conversations that we always promote and foster at our festival. Another element of the Folklife Festival are what we call iconic objects, which are often large installations. One of those installations you'll see here is a flower plaque, which is a traditional uh, installation from Southern China and Hong Kong, made from bamboo, often to mark an important event in the community. And at the 2014 festival, we had uh, people build this bamboo flower plaque. It was more than 30 meters tall and about 100 meters long or wide. We brought Danny Young, the person who designed it. Uh, we brought the team from the um, Wing K flower shop in Hong Kong who build these uh, flower plaques as part of their traditions. And they were there at the festival, not only to to demonstrate the building of this amazing object that you could see when you came out of the Washington Metro system. But they were there to demonstrate their building techniques, their design techniques, and to share their knowledge and their skills with our visitors through these cultural conversations. 
Um, in the case of the flower plaque, the bamboo came, but all the bamboo had to go back to Hong Kong. That was one of the conditions with our US Department of Agriculture that everything that came had to go back. We had a permit for the temporary loan of the bamboo. Uh, it came by ship and then by truck and it went back by truck and by ship. Another iconic object in 1999, we did a program on Romania and we built a traditional wooden church from Romania on the National Mall. Another example is in 2008, we built a Bhutanese temple that was originally built in Timpu, the capital of Bhutan, built and then disassembled and shipped to the United States, reassembled on the National Mall during the Folklife Festival in 2008 and subsequently disassembled. And in this case, shipped to El Paso, Texas, where it is now today on the campus of the University of Texas at El Paso. We love for these objects to have an extended life. Now our festivals are always built on research. So this is a photograph of me from uh, the year 2013 with our program coordinator, Li Jing, who was based in Beijing as we were doing uh, research for the China Festival in 2014. Both myself and my co-curator, Sojin Kim, made several trips to China to identify uh, the, the participants that we would bring to the United States for the Folklife Festival as exemplars of Chinese cultural heritage and tradition. Uh, we were just part of a very large team of people, including speakers of Mandarin or speakers of Cantonese who helped us in the research and production of our Folklife Festival program on China. I think for the last part, I'm gonna focus more on this idea of cultural conversations and with our participants speak with our visitors. So in this photograph, the participant you see, the man on the left is Nathan Jackson, uh, Native American Clinkett from the state of Alaska. He builds these amazing totem poles, wooden structures that may be five or 10 meters tall. So here is Mr. Jackson, who also is the winner of a National Heritage Fellowship, which is the highest honor that we have in the United States for the folk and traditional arts talking about his methods. And unlike in a museum where, you know, they'll say, don't touch, don't touch. Here, the idea is to touch because you can learn through that sense of touch. Uh, this photograph uh, shows uh, participants from the program on Tibetan culture in the year 2000. The, again, the idea is to attract our visitors, to show them something they may not have seen or may not understand and we're helping to build understanding and to share that knowledge and information with them directly. Uh, this photograph from the program in 2005 on the US Forest Service shows Keith Bear, who's Native American from the three affiliated tribes, Mandan, Kadatsa, Arikara in North Dakota. He was there to talk about his traditions of flute playing and flute making. And you can you know, look at the expression on the two girls on the right there. You, know, you can see their rapt attention as Keith Bear is sharing his traditions. You know, we love to get younger visitors involved and touching the sense, you know, the, the younger the better to get them learning at an early age about these traditions. Here's another photograph from the Mekong River program in 2007. The man on the right is Nashi Dongba, talking about his traditions for the visitors. And, and you can see that connection. Yes, I mean, there is a table between them, but the table is not there to separate. It's just you know, a handy place on which uh, we can place materials. But the idea is to engage people directly because we feel that's the best way to learn through face-to-face -face learning directly. You know, in fact, for this lecture, I wish I could be talking directly with you, but instead we're, we're trying a different technology. 
uh, in these in these digital lectures. But for festivals, really the the optimum idea is learning face to face without mediation. You know, you're not looking at a at a telephone in your hand, uh, interacting with someone who's in another location. You're looking at that person directly, and you can see the way that they are engaging by their facial expressions. Another photograph also from our far service program where people are touching the furs, animal furs uh, in the photograph. You get to touch the furs to learn about the different animals uh, to whom these um, furs belong. Uh, another photograph from Mekong River, we had lots of fish traps, fish traps from all over the Mekong, from La Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, China, and Vietnam, showing the different types of fish traps all in one tent, so you could see the different traditions and talk with the fish trap makers. Also at the festival, we always try to get people dancing. And this is a photograph from our Hungry program in 2013. Dance is a very important element in Hungarian tradition. You can see people uh, uh, on the left wearing their dance um, uh, costumes from Hungary. They're actually from a region of Transylvania that is now in Romania, but they are ethnic Hungarians teaching our visitors some of the dance steps. We even built a dance barn, an amazing structure that we built and afterwards disassembled and sent to a Hungarian American camp in the state of New York. More from the Forest Service in this photograph, you see um, uh, the use of what we call a cross saw. The woman on the left with the orange hard hat, she's a visitor, the man on the right with the green hard hat, he's a Forest Service participant, but the idea is to get our visitors learning what it's like because until you've operated one of these cross saws, you really don't know how difficult it is to use uh, this. So again, this idea, these cultural conversations. So I should say that uh, as, I'm, as I'm coming to an end, that although the festival takes place on the National Mall for 10 days, we like for the festival to live on and endure. And thanks to the internet, and the World Wide Web, we can uh, place videos and other visual materials for the festival to continue. Here's a website that I recommend uh, through asia.si.edu that you see on the screen. It's where CFCH worked with our Freer and Sackler galleries, the Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art to post videos from our 2014 Folk Life Festival program on China, including videos about the flower plot that I discussed, but also videos about bronze making, pottery, Chinese opera. It's all there with translation in Mandarin. So to conclude, just to sum up some of the most important points, the, the mission of the Smithsonian to promote the increase in diffusion of knowledge the mission of the Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage, that through the power of culture, we build understanding, strengthen communities, and reinforce our shared humanity. Uh, the idea of the festival being a museum without walls, festival as a verb, culture of the people, by the people, and for the people, and promoting contemporary grassroots cultural traditions not only in the United States. So I hope that this lecture has given you a better understanding of the work that we do of uh, promoting um, cultural heritage in diverse communities. I hope also that you'll have a chance to participate in one of our question and answer periods. You'll find more information about when that uh, Q&A will take place. And here's uh, a final slide showing my contact information, my email address. Please feel free to reach out. So stay tuned and thank you for your attention and take care.